morning, Dr. Bugs. What bug are we learning about today? Well, hey there, Thumper. Today, we are going to learn about a bacteria that is pretty relevant to us rabbits. Have you ever heard of rabbit fever? Oh, yeah, I have heard of that. Little bunny Fufu got that last week, and he died. Well, that does not surprise me. Rabbit fever is caused by a bacteria, and that bacteria is called Francisella tularensis. That's a funny name. Yes, it is. So it was first discovered in Tulare County, California, where humans George McCoy and Charles Chapin were studying plague in our buddies, the ground squirrels, oh. in 1911. So they named the bacteria Bacterium tularens since they found it in Tulare County. Ah, oh. but that's not what they call it now. You're very right. So another human, Edward Francis, linked the bacteria to deer fly fever, which was transmitted from deer flies to us, the rabbits, to humans. And so they renamed the bacteria Francisella tularensis to honor his discovery. Oh, that makes sense. All right, Thumper. Well, we are about to get ready to study for our exam. So let's go ahead and get your pencils out and let's start listening intently. I'm ready. So Francis tularensis is a, a gram negative bacterium that stains very poorly. It's a coco bacillus bacterium and it ranges from 0 0.2 to 0 0.7 micrometers in size. When you see it, when it grows on an agar plate, you'll see it in mostly single cells and the colonies will appear buttery and smooth. And this bacteria is very non-motile. Okay. So there are four strains. There are four subspecies of this bacteria. There is one strain, type A, called Tularensis, which is highly virulent, and it is most common in North America, and it's going to affect us, the animals, and also humans. And then there's a type B called Holarctica, which is a less virulent type found in Europe, Asia, and North America. And then there are two other less virulent strains, and those are called Novicida and Media, Asia Tika. All right, Thumper, how are you doing? Are you getting everything down so far? Yeah, I think so, Dr. Bugs. Okay, good. All right, so this bacteria occurs widely in nature. It's suspected to reside in protozoan cells like amoebas. So what is the life cycle, you might be thinking? Well, it is coming from ticks and fleas and deer flies and mosquitoes and then they bite small animals like us i hate that the rabbits and the voles and the mice and the squirrels and then we can sometimes contaminate our human friends oh no yes and it causes the disease rabbit fever which we talked about earlier and it can cause large die-offs of us, all of our small animal friends. So this disease is highly infectious, this bacterium. Inhalation of as few as 10 organisms can cause disease. And these bacterium can survive for weeks at low temperatures in water, moist soil, straw, and even decaying animal carcasses. But how can it survive? Well, these are aerobic organisms, so they require oxygen to live. The type A strain, which was the most virulent strain, requires more nutrients than the other strains, so it needs them from hosts 
to provide those nutrients for them because it has certain mutations in its genome that the other strains don't have. Okay. But all of the strains do require cysteine for growth. Ah, okay. Wait, what's cysteine? Good question, Thumper. I like that you're asking questions. So cysteine is a sulfur-containing amino acid that is a constituent of many enzymes. So it's a very, very needed thing. Oh, yeah, I knew that. All right. Well, okay. Okay, Thumper. So it also has some pretty special proteins for survival, too. So it's, this bacteria is covered by a capsule. The more virulent the strain, the thicker the capsule. Mm. And this capsule will be covered with type 4 pili, which will aid the bacteria in adherence. It'll help it form biofilms. It'll help it in the uptake in DNA, and it'll aid it in movement. So the type A strain has some special things in particular. It has these things called siderophores. So this strain is iron dependent. So iron is needed for intracellular replication, and it's even needed for its virulence. Wow. What is a siderophore? So these molecules will form when iron is limited in the environment and it'll bind to iron from inorganic and host sources and bring all that good stuff back to the bacteria so it can use it. Oh. Another very interesting thing about these strains. Hey, oh, back over here, Thumper. I'm listening. Okay. Is that it contains an enzyme that'll help it evade the host's immune system. Oh. Yes, it's called ACPA. And what it does is it inhibits respiratory burst. So what respiratory burst means is that it will just inhibit the neutrophils and macrophages in the host system from initiating an immune response. And it can even survive in a macrophage if it needs to evade the host system. So it is a pretty neat bacteria. Did you get all that, Thumper? I think so. I think I got everything, Dr. Bugs. But even though that's all I need to know, is there anything else our human friends should know? Well, that is very good that you asked that because it does not only infect rabbits, it is very virulent in humans too. So in humans, that disease is called tularemia and it's usually misdiagnosed for more common diseases. So the most common form is a skin ulcer appearing at the site where the bacteria entered the body, like a bug bite from those fleas and deer flies and bad, mean things. But the most serious form is the pneumonic, where the symptoms will include cough, chest pain, and difficulty breathing. And if it's left untreated, the bacteria will spread through the bloodstream and get to the lungs. Should they just eat more carrots then? <laughs> oh, Thumper. But the good thing about this disease is it's not spread from person to person. But the bad thing is that if you do get it as a mnemonic, the fatality rates can be very high. They can be 30 to 60 percent. But the good thing, Thumper, for our human friends is it can be successfully treated with antibiotics. So I'm sure you're wondering for our human friends, how can they prevent this, right? Yeah! All right, well, if you're a human out there, there's three different things you can do. When you're out enjoying the outside, use insect repellent. Also, wear gloves when handling sick or dead animals. And try to avoid mowing over dead animals at all costs. All right, Thumper, before you leave, because I know class time is almost up, I save the best for last. 
Really? I did. So, there's also one other big thing for humans. So, this bacteria is considered to be a serious potential bioterrorist threat. What? I know. So, they would make the bacteria airborne. So, remember, which strain is the highly virulent strain? Uh, A. Good. So, this was used in development of biological weapons in the World War II and post-World War II years. So, now, the U.S. government lists it as a Category A select agent. Category A? What does that mean? Well, Flumper, let's have a look at this chart right here. So there's A, B, and C, and some of the main things here are that category A will have high mortality rates, it will have major public health impact, and have public panic. So obviously that's not good, is it, Thumper? No! So this is pretty big, because some of our other category A agents are plague, smallpox, and Ebola. All right, Thumper. Well, I hope that you enjoyed learning about this as much as I enjoyed teaching you. Thanks, Dr. Bugs. Anytime, Thumper.